All right, so last time we were together, um, we, we heard something very important uh, about something that's extremely hard. You know, some of the hardest elements or materials on the planet are metal, bamboo. They almost seem impenetrable. Also, there's diamond. Diamond is one of the hardest materials you'll find on the planet. But our author gave us something to present that's even harder than some of those hardest elements, and that is a hard heart. That the heart, a hard heart towards God, is one that does not experience the fullness of what God wants us to experience. And we said there are six symptoms that we need to recap because it's important that we need to understand if we are exhibiting these symptoms of a hard heart. And the first one we said, a hard heart strays before it disobeys. In, in other words, before you do whatever it is you're going to do that's wrong, within your heart, your affections started to stray before your actions do. Number two, we said a hard heart doesn't hear God's voice over their own uh, because we keep talking and we think that God only exists for our happiness. We don't hear his voice piercing through the sound of our own. Number three, a hard heart takes grace for granted. Did you hear me? A hard heart takes grace for granted. And, and in other words, a, a hard heart assumes or lives with an entitled attitude as if somehow that God owes us dying for us, and that's just simply not true. Number four, a hard heart rarely admits that they need help. Any witnesses in here? Come on, come on. What, like, you, you're always, I'm all right, I'm good, I'm okay. You, your, your response is you, you, you're the pull yourself by your own bootstraps type of a person. But, but listen, let me help you out. E even if you're not a believer this morning, the, the earth is rigged that you cannot do life alone. It, it is rigged. God has rigged it that you, you cannot do anything exclusively apart from some help. Number five, a hard heart is never satisfied. The very thing you're, you're praying for, you get that, then you want something else. Then you get that, then you want something else. It is never satisfied. And number six, this is very important, a hard heart forfeits favor for frustration. That tongue twister, a hard heart forfeits God's favor, which is his grace, for frustration, because the point our author was communicating here is, is that we want to work rather than receiving the free gift of grace that we get only through faith in Christ. In other words, we somehow want to earn what God says, no, it can only be given, because if you earn it, then I have to judge you based on your work. But if you place faith in me, I judge my son's work, and my son's work is better than yours. And so he wants us to experience that. So now our author transitions, and I want to ask you a question. What is a four-letter word that everyone wants, but very few people actually achieve? A lot of y'all said love. That's a good one, but it's not love. It is R-E-S-T, rest. Anybody here want some rest? Oh, only a couple of y'all. Some people put both hands up, right? Anyone here, wants some, anyone here needs some rest? Right? It want rest or needs rest, but, but that, that's a, a right, right? That four letter word is profound, it's needed, but very few people actually achieve it. And this was the alley oop from chapter three into chapter four, because here's what he said in verse 11 of chapter three So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Now, if God says you won't rest, you won't rest. But what we have to do is begin to figure out what type of rest is being communicated here. Uh, rest, this short and yet powerful word, really shows us something about our attitudes because the reality is all of us have access to rest, but many of us have the wrong attitude about rest. In fact, American culture is obsessed with workaholism. Couple stats, any coffee drinkers in here this morning? It, it, okay, 95% of the church, okay. 64% of American adults consume coffee every day. The average American th drinks three cups of coffee per day. Americans drink 400 million cups of coffee per year. American, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Americans drink 400 million cups of coffee per day. Americans drink 146 billion cups of coffee per year. Coffee shops see a 7% growth every year, and the annual coffee retail sales are about $5.2 billion. Now, with all of this coffee consumption, the CDC has reported that Americans were simply not getting enough rest. 
One in three Americans aren't getting enough sleep. The average American sleeps less than seven hours per night. Check this out. Consumers, American consumers spent $41 billion on sleep-related uh, sleep products in 2015, and that number is, that is set to go up to $52 billion by 2020. Now, here's the point. Again, the, the issue, listen to me, and I know some of you mentally you're, you're, you're going to push back because you're going to say, Pastor Jerome, you don't know my schedule. Pastor Jerome, you don't know the responsibilities I have. So some of you right now, you're pushing back and saying, yeah, I hear you, but I just can't get rest. Pastor Jerome, my schedule won't allow me to get rest. I have to do it. If I don't do it, it won't get done. The issue, again, listen, the issue is not your access to rest. The issue is your attitude towards rest. And, and I, want, I want you to hear this because we have passed down a dysfunctional attitude about rest. I, I want you to see this. Uh, th there's a little graphic I want to put up that breaks down the generations. Baby boomers. If you were born between 1946 and 1964, you are a baby boomer. Baby boomers were the biggest workaholics ever. It was all about work. We literally get the term tenure from the baby boomer generation. They would stay in a job for their life and retire. Then my generation, Generation X, if you're born between 65 and 79, we were the latchkey kid generation. We came home to empty houses because our parents had to and they were working, so we came home to empty, empty houses. A lot of our parents were working double jobs, so at night shift, we would be able to determine what time we went to bed because we would not only come home to an empty house, sometimes we would sleep in an empty one. So we have the baby boomers, then we have Generation X, and, and according, listen to this, according to Fitbit sleep data, Americans in their 40s and early 50s get the least amount of sleep. Millennials, where are my millennials at? 1980 to 1995. Be careful before you cheer too loud. <laughs> Forbes says millennials are now at a crossroads between their need to sleep and their desire to stay awake. Because your generation, this is Forbes, don't get mad at Pastor Gay, this is Forbes. You scared you're going to miss something. So the millennials, you're always connected. Unlike boomers who took drugs to mellow out, millennials are increasingly taking stimulants like Ritalin, Adderall, and Modafinil to stay focused in the classroom and the workplace. Be because you think multitasking is a badge of honor. In Generation Z, 1996 to 2010, we ain't got enough information on y'all yet. But... Y'all doing a whole bunch of stuff early. So in essence, when we kind of break this down generationally, what we see is sleep and rest are really dreams to never be realized. Catch that? They're dreams never to be realized. Why? Now, why won't we rest? Number one, because fear of lack. Man, if, if I don't work, if I don't grind, I won't have enough. And I refuse, especially if some of us, like myself, were raised in poverty. Or if you had to stand in a welfare line like I did for that hard, thick government cheese. It took 15 minutes to start melting. Fear of rejection. If, if I don't keep saying yes... They'll reject me, so I'll overcommit myself. Listen, this is the biggest one, and this is going to get to the heart of our text as we break it down. Fear of not mattering. I, I won't matter if I'm not always on, so in order to prove my value to myself, I overwork myself. But the author wants us to know that we can experience Rest. How many of y'all take power naps? Power naps? Okay, yeah, I love power naps. I can, five minutes, I'm good. I will do that. I will take a power nap in a heartbeat. But the type of rest our author is pointing us to is not a nap or a vacation. He's pointing us to eternal rest, and eternal rest is free from three things. Number one, 
It's free from outward activity. E eternal rest is this idea of, I don't always have to do something. Eternal rest is this idea of resting in who God is and what he's done. The, the second thing eternal rest uh, allows me to be free of, to be free, and, 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 and this is shout, shout worthy, to be free from inward anxiety. Because even if you put me in the perfect spot, if I have anxiety, I could be in the perfect beach, in the perfect bungalow with the perfect ambiance and still not have rest. Thirdly, though, so it's free from outward activity, inward anxiety. Thirdly, it's free from downward adversity. The Bible says we rest against spiritual wickedness where in high places coming down to attack us. And so many of us put our poker face on in church. We always have it together. God knows that's not true. You know that's not true. The enemy knows that not true. But, but there's an eternal rest that's free from outward activity, inward anxiety, and downward adversity. And that rest is only possible if you place your faith in him. And, and he says, listen, because some of you, listen, you, you're so used to overworking, you don't believe me. And you nod your head yes, but your action says, Jerome, get out of here. <laughs> Go ahead. Here's how you say it. Yeah, I know what the Bible said, but I'm trying to be real. But the Bible's not real to you. So remember this. Because we keep hearing the word every week since we started this series, therefore, therefore, therefore. Everything's connected. Now, remember what he said in chapter 1, verse 3. He said that Jesus was able to sit. No high priest was able to sit. There was not a chair in the tabernacle because they always had to work. But Jesus was able to take that seat because this is the rest that he promises us. So let's go, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received good news, just as they did. But the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in the face. First point, God does not renege on his rest. Did you hear me? God does not renege on his rest. Now, again, we're not talking about just a nap. Now, there, there are elements of the Sabbath here because the Sabbath is a, is a commandment and not a suggestion. But what he's telling us here is that the, the rest that God promises has to do symbolically with his safety, his security, and salvation. For those of you taking notes, eternal rest deals with safety, security, and salvation. And so what he says is, all right, the promise of God's rest still remains. Now, you got to remember what we said last week. Because what our author did is he, he quoted Psalm 95, and then he pointed us to Numbers chapter 14. And what he was doing there is he was saying is that the reason they didn't enter God's rest is because they refused to do it my way. And so many of you, you're here right now, and you're saying, uh, again, the issue is not your access to rest, it's your attitude about rest. And because your attitude is one of pride, and we, I gave you the prophecy my mom would give me, a hard head makes a what? And so you're experiencing that right now. Your hard head is making a hard bed. Because even when you lay down, you still don't get rest. So he doesn't renege on his rest. So he says the promise of God's rest still remains. Here's the point he's making. Rest is a person, not a place. Rest is a person, not a place. So when it says it still remains, he's saying even though Israel, they didn't enter and what God prophesied in Numbers chapter 14 is, you won't enter, but your children will. You didn't set a good example in your generation, but God says, my grace is sufficient, so I'll raise up another one. Aren't you glad to know that even if you blow it, your children's children's children don't have to? God says, if you don't do it, I'll use someone else to do it. So God gives, and he says, I'm not, I'm not going to renege on it. They didn't enter my rest. You might not be in experience in rest. You might be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, but as tired as you want to be. And God is saying, no, you still have access. I didn't renege on it. You just won't do it my way. You refuse to say no. And you're eating the fruit because you're saying yes to them, but God says, you're saying no to me. 
Do you not realize that some of your yeses to people is a no to your creator? So, he says, you won't enter my rest. They didn't enter. Not because they don't have access. The promise still remains. God doesn't renege on his promise for rest. And so this is why he wants them to understand, don't take my grace for granted. You have access, but make sure you're not giving it to a hard heart. The second thing he points out there, he says, they heard the good news. What does that sound like? Gospel. I love it because he's saying the gospel was in the Old Testament. Uh Uh-oh, come on, family. He said that the good news was in the Old Testament. They heard the good news, but then he says it did not benefit them. Why? Listen to me. Hearing the gospel isn't enough. Did you hear me? Coming to church, hearing good messages isn't enough. You can hear a good message. You can say amen to that message. But if it doesn't penetrate your heart, it was just dead words to you. The way you get the fruit of the message of God is to apply it to your life. So if I said right now, the Shell gas station around the corner, they are, for, for three days, they're selling gas for 25 cents a gallon. Some of y'all would leave the middle of the sun. <laughs> Pastor, I might be back. But if you know gas is 25 cents a gallon, but you don't go get it, guess what? Your tank still stays empty. Some of you, your spiritual tank is empty. You have access, but you're not taking advantage of the access that you have. So he's saying they, they heard, but it was no benefit to them because they didn't apply it. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13. He quotes Isaiah 6 to highlight how you can be close to the things of God. You can hear the word of God. You could have been raised in the church. You could have spent four hours in church. You could have went to VBS. You could have went to Awana. You could have memorized scripture. You could have did your sword drills. You can quote all 66 books of the Bible and still not know Because you're around the things of God, but you're not in Christ. You can be around him but not in him. Listen, and and family, I I need you to hear this. Vision isn't exempt. We do verse by verse teaching. We preach the gospel every week. We dress down. We're missional. We do small groups. And you can get, you can do that legalistically and still not have a relationship. You can be hearing solid doctrine, but that doctrine not penetrates your heart. So family, I need us to get this. Like vision, we're not exempt from this. We're more like the people that disobey than the ones that obey. And that's what should keep us humble. That's what keeps us from self-righteously judging the people that come in here. So if they come here, still tipsy. If they come here, smelling like weed. If they come here with something skimpy, what we do is we give them the gospel to let them know that there's grace for them because I still need that same grace, even though I've been walking with the Lord since I was 13. I've been walking with God with 13, and you know what I still need? Grace. If I, I, I do not want my thoughts on this big old 95-inch screen behind me because you'd be like, Lord, we need a new pastor. <laughs> we all need grace. Amen? Amen? Verse 3, for we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I sworn my anger. This is God. They will not enter my rest. Even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works again. In that passage, he says, they will not enter my rest. Here here we go again. He quotes Psalm 95. Psalm 95 has this phrase, I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Now, here's what he's doing. He's giving us Five aspects of a theology of rest. Listen, this will be a game changer for your life if you apply it. Number one, you need to know this. Number one, about having a good theology of rest. Number one, rest starts at creation. Isn't it? Family, how can God, who spoke and planets formed, who spoke And the sky listened. Who took dirt and created you? Who took a rib and created a woman? When he spoke, Jupiter and all his complexities were formed. When he spoke, 
the skies would light up during the day. When he spoke, the moon knew when to come into the place it needs to be. When he spoke, the earth rotates around the sun and is not one centimeter off of where it needs to be. When he spoke, he did all of this. And then this God, who has the ability to speak this into existence, said, I'm going to take a break. And you don't. Have you ever thought about it like God? Now, here's what you need to understand. Listen, God's rest was one of satisfaction, not exhaustion. God wasn't tired like, man, goodness, whoo, man, Adam, boy, took me a while to make you from that dirt, boy. Eve, girl, I took that rib and fashioned you. I, man, God, t- no, he wasn't tired. Adam was, though. Think about it. Adam, like, okay, next, elephant, shark, whale, baboon, monkey, chimpanzee, ant, spider, snake. Then he brings woman. (laughs) This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Go ahead and spin around, Eve, for your boy. This is mine. Because I know he looking like, no, nah, that chimpanzee resembles, but nah. that bear, she too tall. Nah. But he sees the woman. He like, woo, this bone of what? My bone, flesh of my flesh. And God even listened before the fall God instituted rest. So the second thing about a theology of rest, rest is intended to be delightful. Remember, rest existed before sin. Number three, rest is a gift. He declared the seventh day to be a day of rest before the fall. Number four, rest is needed. Say this, say, I have limitations. Some of you hard-headed people didn't say it. One more time, I have Limitation. One more time for that person who's just so hard-headed. Don't be telling me what to say. One more time. I have limitations. Yeah, you can't do everything. Listen, listen. And you never will. Because you weren't intended to. Okay? But number five, the theology of rest. Bears repeating. Rest is a person. So listen, God does not renege on his rest. But we need to have a proper theology. Family, question, what is your theology? If you don't know what that word, what is your philosophy of rest? And and don't just give me your words. Uh, I I answer that by looking at your schedule. Your schedule reveals your theology or your philosophy of rest. Is there time when you're not always on? I feel like the Lord is just digging in our hearts right now. Verse 6. Therefore, that word again, therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, now the invitation is for all, y'all. Now, again, I need you to get this. This eternal rest is more than a nap. It's salvation. Some will not enter that rest because they won't do it God's way. That's why it's some. Some will, but some won't. And those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of what? Disobedience. He again specifies a certain day today. He specified this speaking through David. After such a long time today, if you hear his voice and not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken later about a, God would not have spoken later about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains. See, God won't renege. For who? God's people. For the person who has entered his rest. And rested from what? His own works. Just as God did from his, let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. Listen, after pointing us to what rest looks like, he he names two giants, Old Testament giants, David and Joshua. So what he just did is he gave David credit for Psalm 95. He's saying David wrote that. Now here's what you need to understand. In him saying that, 
David was focusing on Israel's rebellion that kept them from entering into the promised land, but David also records that grace is still available. Here's what I need you to understand, because God is going to convict me. He's convicting us about rest. He's convicting us about our schedule, but he's saying, even though you keep messing up, there's grace. It, 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 even though you, you, keep ref, you keep making excuses to stay exhausted. Then God said, why are you praying about something you won't do something about? So even though they, their disobedience kept them out, there was still grace for someone to enter. Aren't you glad God doesn't completely cut you off? And I cancel American culture where we cancel people when they mess up. We cancel them when they tweet the wrong thing. We cancel them when they say the wrong thing. What if God was like us? We all be canceled. This would be canceled church in Christ. But then he mentions Joshua. So, so after doing this, Joshua, here's the thing he's doing. Again, I, 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 for those that like rap, I told you, man, there's so many bars <laughs> in this text. What he just did was he's given us some biblical Old Testament imagery so that we can dream and see the beauty of what he's saying. Moses didn't enter. Joshua did. Even though Joshua entered Canaan and they entered this land flowing with milk and honey, the point he's making is that even though they entered, the people still disobeyed. So he's saying that while Joshua was able to enter, that was a physical land. I'm not talking about just physical rest. So Joshua entered, but Jesus is better than Joshua. Joshua gave you human bodily rest and abundance. Jesus promised, promises eternal rest, eternal security, eternal significance, eternal rest. Quick review. Creation rest. This was broken at the fall, but not beyond repair. Jesus restores it. Canaan rest, right? Canaan rest is this land flowing with milk and honey. Family, uh, men, I want to challenge us. What I do is whenever I'm preaching, whenever I'm preaching, that's our family devotion on Saturdays. So this text, Hebrews 4, 1 through 16, was our family devotion yesterday morning. And so we, we uh, sometimes we're at the kitchen table, sometimes we're at the, at the bed. Um, in the bed, and we all got our Bibles out. And, and I said, all right, family, uh, I want to ask you guys a question. What, what, what would be the perfect vacation spot? And what would be the top three things you want? I said, all right, baby, you go first. So Crystal said, no schedule. I said, no schedule? She said, yeah, I don't want no itinerary. I don't want any expectations. I just want to. I said, okay. She said, good food. <laughs> she got a witness. Uh, and now my wife, when we go to hotels, my wife examines the bed. So number one, she makes sure that thing is clean and that she ain't got to call the front desk, but then she want to make sure that it's soft. I said, okay, baby, okay. Uh, I said, Jamari, she said, uh, I want to go to Bora Bora. You 14. She said, bore, bore. I said, okay. She said, with my friends. I said, okay. And uh, she said, then I, I want clear water. I want water where I can see through the water. Okay, cool. Jordan, what you got, Jordan? Now, my son, eight. Jordan said, I want to go on an African safari. He <laughs> said, okay. He said, yeah, I want to have my boy Richie. That's one of his classmates with him. And he said, I want to be around the animals but I don't want them to get us. <laughs> my boy's smart. He said, remember, this is my dream, so I want to make sure I want to be close, but I don't want them to get me. And I said, me, I said, listen, I want to go on a cruise. I've never gone on a cruise. I'm 40 and I still haven't gone on a cruise. I want to go on a cruise. I want, I, want the, I want the food to be phenomenal. And then I want to go, I want it to be one of those where you can stop and go snorkeling. But I've never gone snorkeling. And I said, okay, we got, all right, we got all of our situation together. I said, if you had all of that, perfect, everything you wanted, but if you still had worry, it would mess up the perfect trip. 
can't have a perfect trip as long as the internal anxiety remains. This is why God promises us a different type of rest. He says everything here, even the perfect vacation, when you come back home, there are things to worry about. God says, I have a rest for you that exists in glory where there will be no more worries. It's done. That's the rest that I desire for you. But that's what he wants us to understand. Creation rest was broken but restored. Canaan rest was not complete, but Christ rest. See, Christ is our Sabbath. And the key to understanding Jesus is our Sabbath rest is that Hebrew word Shabbat. It means to stop or to cease from work. It doesn't mean for you to go quit your job. What he's saying is, is to rest in the finished work of Christ because you can never make yourself right with God. No matter how hard you try, you can never make yourself right with God. You cannot come before God and say, I sat through that hour service with my mama. I did that. He said, hey, and God going to be like, and? My standard is perfection. And the only way for you to achieve this standard is to be in my son. This is why they, Israel was constantly trying to earn and they had to keep offering sin offerings because they would never perfectly keep the ceremonial law, the Mosaic law. They would never uh, achieve those laws. They, they always would mess up. And that's my testimony. That's yours. I can't, I can't even get, I, I, I can't even keep promises to me. See, yeah, yeah. See, I need a real church. What's our phrase? We're, we're not perfect, but we're progressing. So I, I can't even keep my own promises to myself. So you think I'm going to keep promises to a perfect, holy, righteous, spotless, sinless God? No. But someone did that for me. And I'm grateful that that's what Jesus did for me. That's why it says in Hebrews 10, 12, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down at the right hand of God. Bring us to our next point. Listen, family. Learn from the bad examples in your life. Don't repeat them. Where are you getting that from, Pastor Gate? That's why he's bringing up Israel. He's saying, listen, learn from their bad example. Don't repeat it. They didn't enter his rest. That's going to be you if you follow their pattern. Learn from, listen, learn from the workaholics. Don't emulate their workaholism. Learn from the people, listen, who have sacrificed their family at the altar of a career, who have sacrificed their, their family at the altar of more degrees, who have sacrificed their family at the altar of their personal fame. Learn from their mistake, and don't you sacrifice yours. Family, can I tell you, being in ministry the first three years, I blew it as a husband. A friend of mine says, he tells church planters, he says one of the first affairs a church planter has is with his church. My wife hated Vision International Church because it took her husband away. I blew it. We had one vacation the first three years. I blew it. And thank God for men rebuking me, challenging me, digging in me, and saying that if you think you're going to keep that church together, you need to give it up because it's God's church, not your church. Which is why, family, why Pastor Gay takes sabbaticals. I, I ain't. I'm not going to use proper grammar. I ain't. Preaching 52 Sundays out of 52 weeks. Amen. Because, and if you cared about my family, you wouldn't want me to. Exactly. I need to go old school. Ah! <laughs> so, what he, so what he said, make every effort, he says, to enter this rest. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to say yes to God things and no to good things. Every opportunity isn't evil. 
but it may not be for you. You know, because I mean, the enemy will, he'll, he's slick. Remember, the Bible says schemes in Ephesians 6. So he'll say, look, no, it ain't, it ain't sinful. But it might be sinful for you to do this instead of waiting. Because the reason we overcommit ourselves is because we don't trust God. And I'm talking to myself, too. The reason you and I overcommit is because we don't trust. All right, listen to me. They didn't enter their rest because of their disobedience. Just sidebar, I need, you to, I need you to know the difference between being tired, that's a good thing, but being exhausted, that's a sinful thing. Prove it, Pastor Gay. Jesus was tired, John 4, verse 6. See, some of you, you I, I get tired. Sometimes parents, now, now just can you, parents, can we be honest? Do you get tired watching your, your own kids? <laughs> no, no, some of y'all lied. So I'm, I'm going to ask this side because I feel like we got a relationship. <laughs> Do you get tired watching your own kids? Come on. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Now, but listen, that's a good tired because that's your responsibility. It's a good tired. I get some, as a provider, sometimes I'm tired from my work. That's a good tired. When you read John 4, 6, Jesus was tired. Remember, he's God and man. In his humanity, he was tired. That's a good tired. So, so tired isn't necessarily a bad thing. I get tired after a good workout. I'm doing something good, but I'm still exerting energy. So tiredness within itself isn't sinful. But exhaustion. See, exhaustion affects your mind, your body, your soul, your energy. And what exhaustion does is it drains you of hope. Anybody with me? It drains you of hope. So this occurs when I don't set healthy boundaries and I don't say that two-letter powerful word, no. Here's what I need you to say no to, family. Listen, we have to say no to the lie that the more I do, the more valuable I am. Please let that stay up there for a little bit. We have to say no to the lie that the more I do, the more valuable I am. So I'm going to say no to a works-based salvation that tells me I have to earn God's love, I have to earn God's grace. I'm going to say yes to the free gift of salvation he's given me. I'm secure because of what, he's, what he did for me. Two things with this last section. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. The word of God there is not just talking about the Bible. It's also talking about what we call the incarnate word. John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt. Greek word skanao, pitched a tent. That's what skanao means. The word was made flesh. So it's not just the Bible, the graphe. It's also the logos, the living word. So that's what he's saying. Three things about it. Number one, it's living and active. When God speaks, he acts. You're not just reading dead words on a page. You're reading the living word of God. Number two, it's sharper, say sharper, sharper. than any double-edged sword. Now, here's what it means. Now, the image is like a small, almost like the spatha from Ephesians 6. It's a shank. But the point of this one was to carve meat. So what he's saying is, in context, the word is sharper than your wit. He can cut through the surface level skin that you present as if okay, the word of God cuts through that. You're not going to out because it's sharper than your wit. It's sharper than your excuses. It's sharper than your manipulation. It's sharper. And number three, it cuts deep. Cuts deep. My hood used to say to the white meat. You ever been cut to the white meat? It, it cuts deep. Now, now here's, here's how we said it when we did. Th there's primarily, this is talking about the eternal, internal cutting. God's word cuts you. What you find is when you read it, you find that it reads you. Now, there are several responses to the cutting of God. Number one, many of us, we get scared and we run. So we never experience the beauty of God cutting us. Yes, it's a beauty. Number two, we won't stay still and move. 
So the process starts. You, you go to the church. You go to the group. You go to whatever you need to go to. You get cut. But then because you don't like the fact that someone else got you, someone else to peer into your life, now you're walking around bleeding. Because you didn't let the surgery, you didn't allow the surgery, the operation to be complete. Here's number three. Here's, what I, here's my prayer for us. That we accept the cutting of God's word and get healed. You got me? A, sur- a surgeon, um, when they work on someone with a staphylococcal infection, it is threefold what they do. They, they cut the area that's infected. They then remove the infection. And then they cover the place that was infection, infected with something in order to start the healing process. What the author of Hebrews is saying, he's given us this threefold view of how the Lord works in our lives. He cuts you deep. He then shows you, because here's the difference between a natural surgery and a spiritual surgery. A natural surgery, you're sedated. A spiritual surgery, you're awake. And what God does is he cuts the area open. He removes the infection. He wants you awake to see the infection so you won't put it back in you with another bad relationship, another bad way of thinking, another bad place to go, some other bad friends, bad company, corrupts good character. So God says, I want you awake during this surgery, so I'm going to cut, I'm going to expose. But then I love the third part of the natural surgery for the staphylococcal uh, infection is they cover it. So they cut, they open and expose, but then they cover. They cut remove, cover. That's what God does for you. He cuts you, he removes, but then thank God the blood covers. Verse 14, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Three themes in chapter four. We've covered two. Number one is rest. Here's number two here, sympathy. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace. So, again, rest, that was verses pretty much 1 through 13. But here's this this idea of sympathy. Here's the point. This is beautiful. Our God is a sympathetic high priest. Early in this book, he The first time in all of scripture, he called Jesus an apostle, which means sent one. But then it lets us know that he's a high priest, which is a mediator. So he's the sent one sent to mediate the relationship that's broken between you and God. So this mediator, when he says he's the high priest, he uses a word that doesn't refer to earthly high priest. So what he does here is he's saying not only is he the mediator, he's a mediator that sympathizes with your mess ups. Did you hear that? He sympathizes. So here's here's the three aspects of sympathy. Sympathy, number one, is to feel for. I feel for you. The second level of sympathy is to feel like I've been there. But then there's a third component that Jesus does feel with. I feel for you. I felt like you, but I also feel with you. That's why it says in verse chapter 2, verse 18, for he himself suffered when he was being tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. In other words, one of the things is uh, Crystal and I had to wrestle with with her severe arthritis after Jordan's birth is that I do my best to understand, but I physically don't know. I don't have arthritis in every joint. My wife does. And, and, And so... There's, there's this thing to where, baby, I, I want to understand. I want to be there. I want whatever you need. I want to take stuff off of you. But Jesus goes a step further. He says, because he was tempted, not only, see, Jesus can say to her, I know what it's like. This is why he became a man. You get it? This is why he's God and man, because he can say, I know what it's like. See, my wife can say, well, you don't know what it's like to have arthritis in every joint, right? But there's nothing you can tell Jesus, you don't know what it's like. Now, you will say, well, well, Jesus was never raped. 
Jesus never uh, was, was never a paraplegic. Remember, temptation and sin, the Bible says he tasted death. He did this. Jesus says, I, I, I may not have gone through everything experientially to the degree you're saying, but I know what it's like because I've been tempted and I felt the weight of all the world's sin. You don't know what that's like. I know what it's like from an experiential standpoint, so I can identify with you. Third theme is this, boldness or confidence. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace. Listen, family, this is not an actual throne. This is what's called an anthropomorphism. Big fancy word that you're saying. Sometimes authors will attribute human elements to God because God fully discloses incorporeal, which means he doesn't have a body. John 4, 24, God is spirit. He's incorporeal. He doesn't have a body. But in Jesus, that's a flesh example. I'm sorry, the bodily dwell, not an example. He is God in the flesh for us to see who God is. How can I approach this with confidence? How, How can I approach the throne of grace with confidence? Well, because he's our high priest. This is why Matthew writes in Matthew 27, 51, says the veil of the temple was torn in two. But I like this detail. It says from the top to the bottom. The veil was not torn from the bottom to the top meaning it wasn't torn by the earthly priest. When Jesus died, the veil of the temple, the, the place that separated the holy from the holy of holies, because only the high priest could enter the holy of holies, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, showing us the mission of God. Get this, it's torn from the top to the bottom because Jesus came from the top to the bottom to save you. Yeah. So this picture of the veil being torn from the top to the bottom, that detail that Matthew includes in there, it's not just, it's not just a happenstance detail. He said, I want you to know how God did this. God left glory. Prove it. He said he walked through the heavens. He says Jesus passed through the heavens so that we can go with him there. So he did this for us. We can rest. I got a love-hate relationship with Duke Energy. (laughs) I love a heated house. I love lights that come on. I hate the bill. Anybody else? I got to love. If you work for them, I rebuke you (laughs) in Jesus' name. I got a love-hate relationship with Duke because I got to pay for the power. But here's the love part. I rest well knowing that because the bill's paid, when I get up the next day and I hit that switch, the light's going to come on because the bill's paid. When you know the bill is paid, you can rest a little better. Well, Jesus paid your bill. And because Jesus paid the debt of sin that you owe, I can rest better knowing that the bill is paid. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much, God.